Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to our Cancer Smart Discussion, Support for the Caregiver, Practical Advice and Tips for Coping. I'm Stacy Sager from WABC-TV Eyewitness News here in New York, and I will be your moderator. Our expert panel, including experienced caregivers, will discuss the emotional burden of this role and give advice and tips to help caregivers and their families. Joining me tonight is Dr. Allison Applebaum, a psychologist and director of the Caregivers Clinic, which is housed in the Memorial Sloan Kettering Counseling Center, and Linda Matthew, a licensed clinical social worker. Caregivers Carla Smith and Stacy Lawrence also join us. Carla was caregiver to both her parents, and Stacy is currently the caregiver for her husband, who was recently diagnosed with lung cancer. Let's start the program with a short video from a few caregivers we recently spoke with who will talk about what it was like finding out their loved one had cancer. Looking back on the experience, I, I would definitely say that it was a lot of, I guess, fear. Compassion, I guess, was also another emotion that I felt, empathy. Um, you never want to see that happen to your parent, and it was definitely a different dynamic as far as caring for someone. Once we got the diagnosis, that event in and of itself is like a bomb going off. I went numb, I know Sally went numb, because we both needed to process this, because this, this is... Everything that you've thought of that your life is going to be up to this point changes. It was like a gut punch, really. Um, you're confused. You're not sure of where to turn and what the next step is. So you're lost and you're looking for direction and you're looking for answers. And all you want is for your partner to be well. Answers are so hard to come by sometimes, and it is so, so difficult. Stacy, I want to start with you. I'm sure you can relate because this is all very new. Your husband was diagnosed with lung cancer in June, and it, that is like, you know, extremely recent and extremely raw, I'm sure. Yeah, it was very shocking. Um, he's a really healthy guy and 46 years old. We had no idea that um, this was brewing. And, um, it, it did take a while for it to sort of sink in. Um, I think at first it sort of not believing it. And, you know, now through time we're trying to deal with it. And, and also something that, you know, I really try to focus on is, you know, what I can control is in front of us. So, you know, I, in the beginning I was really, you know, you have a lot of feelings of guilt of what could we have done and not, that's all out of your control there you know and so I think sort of grappling with that concept and coming to terms with it and then trying to move ahead and well what can we do what can we do to make things as good as they can be because in effect your life is turned upside down and it is very sudden um, I was a caregiver more than 30 years ago when I was a teenager and it has stuck with me for decades the burden the stress the emotional roller coaster. My mother, I was going off to college and my mother had terminal cancer. Maybe you can explain for some of the people, Dr. Applebaum, just what are these initial concerns that come up with people of all ages, really, sure, whether you're a teenager sure. or later in life? Absolutely. So the experience of having a loved one diagnosed with cancer of any site or any stage at any time in your life is distressing. So certainly anxiety and distress come up immediately. There's also this whirlwind of all of a sudden my life is being turned upside down. Um, caregivers are often asked immediately to reconsider how to balance their potential paid employment with responsibilities of taking care of their loved ones, taking care of their children, their other, other responsibilities. Um, some other concerns that come up immediately is how do I actually speak to my loved one and speak to the physicians about cancer? There's such a steep learning curve of medical information that caregivers will say, oh boy, I need to learn this really, really fast. Um, and certainly for caregivers of patients who've been diagnosed with advanced cancer or life-limiting illnesses, immediately we see fear and anticipatory grief. I do think it's important what Stacy said about worrying about what you can control. And, and perhaps you can elaborate on that um, as well, Linda, because just, you know, the healthcare system is hard to <laughs> navigate, and I'm sure that you are instrumental in helping caregivers navigate it. So what do you tell people when they first come into this whole process about what they need to know? So one thing we do tell is that you're the eyes and ears 
for that for your loved one. So you are in that room collecting the information as the doctor is sharing the diagnosis and what the treatment plan is because the, the patient itself is not hearing any of that information when they're in the room. So you as a caregiver, are, you're vital because you get to hear all that information and then maybe write down all the questions that may need to be asked because in the moment, no one can like process what's going on. So you get to take a step back and kind of say, what questions do we need to ask right now? And then as well, you're the eyes and ears at home in terms of saying, okay, I see some side effects that are happening that seem to be persistently going on. Should I call the doctor or should I call the nurse and let them know what's happening in the moment? So it's good, I, as a reporter, I always took my notepad and my pen with me whenever I went to an appointment. And I know, Carla, you mentioned that as well. And you've yes. dealt with two parents now yes. who've died from cancer. And I'm yes. sure you, you're an expert on this, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. You correct. brought the notepad too? Yes, the notepad, the iPad. Um, texting, Googling, um, constantly trying to bring yourself up to speed on the situation at hand. Uh, normally after all of our appointments as a family, we would always go to lunch. I think that was a way to have a comfort moment and sort of digest what we were told or what we experienced and sort of get ourselves ready for the next appointment or just sort of wrapping up our day. Um, and can I just add to that in terms of, yeah. you know, in terms of Google, I feel like a lot of people go to Google and we always say, be careful with that because yes. there's so much misguided information out there. And what we also notice is people put information when it's not, it's negative versus something that's gone right mm. in terms of their health care and their terms of their treatment for their loved one. So if you are interested in terms of saying, where should I go, contact your social worker, contact Dr. Applebaum, and we can guide you in terms of where to go for information. That is correct, because during the doctor's appointments, uh, our doctors would always give out like an informational card, mm -hmm. and sometimes we would you know, have to look up the terminology, because we're laymen, we're not really familiar. Um, and I have three other siblings, so a lot of times we would do a lot of things through email or texting, because they live on the West Coast, and that made things sort of a challenge at times, just trying to keep everyone up to date on where we were with prognosis and treatment, et cetera. What would you say was the, the biggest challenge that you had as a caregiver, Carla? Uh, if there was- That it was my parents. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you wanna give your parents respect. Mm -hmm. My parents uh, were diagnosed late in life and they were a couple that did everything for themselves always paying of bills. You know, my parents had a business. So it was very difficult um, not wanting to take charge. You had to sort of step back and see exactly where they needed to have help and sort of build from there. And I imagine it impacts your relationship a lot. How, Linda, how would you say this impacts the relationship between the caregiver and the patient? They're not just yeah. family anymore. I mean, they're always family, but you know, they want to communicate, but it's not such great news all the time. Mm -hmm. So how does it change the relationship? So I think one, it depends on the role. So if it's a, if it's a spouse with their husband or wife, um, it impacts it in terms of you going from that intimate relationship to a professional caregiver role, which sometimes then the intimate relationship gets lost. So we always encourage in terms of communication and saying, hey, you know, I miss, I miss our bond. I miss what's happened in terms of our relationship as um, significant others. In terms of other caregivers, I feel like there's always this balance between being the person who's providing now for the family as a financial provider now for the family mm -hmm. and having to work outside and then also caring for your loved one or also caring for young children at home and then the demands of that as well as your own emotional demands and spiritual distress that you're going through. Stacey, you mentioned something very interesting to me before this started and yeah. you know, involving communication because it's not only communication with the patient, you have teenage daughters. Right. Right. So it's how do you communicate with them? You're sort of getting it from all ends. Absolutely. I mean, teenage years are hard anyway, and right. now this kind of gets thrown in the mix. Um, and, you know, it's funny. I was talking, Carla and I were talking about this before. It is really important, I think, to make sure you, you have an outlet, that you do do some things for yourself, whether it be, you know, taking a yoga class or doing your nails or whatever. 
that because then you become a better caregiver, mm -hmm. or else it just becomes way too much. And I think it's easy to almost sort of feel guilty about that in a way, like, oh, well, I can't do anything for myself. I've got to worry about everyone. But you do have to. And I think because then you can be there for everyone. And I, I thought that was um, it's a really important point. Well, it's um, like the point they, they always saw on the, um, on the airplanes when they lower the oxygen mask yeah, for the, exactly. the parent right. before the child exactly. because you have to be okay. That's right. Dr. Applebaum, I imagine there's a lot of things that aren't said, right? For sure. <laughs> Between the caregiver and the patient. What is this so-called network of silence that we talk about? Sure. Um, so, or don't talk about. Or don't talk about. Yeah. Um, often caregivers will tell me that there's something that they're not telling their loved one. And usually that something is not a piece of medical information. Um, it's something about how they are feeling emotionally about their loved one's illness, about their loved one's prognosis, and about the future. The reality is their loved one is likely also holding back some information about how they're feeling. And when we hold back information, when we don't speak, we are giving each other permission to not speak further. We're teaching one another to, to not communicate. And that's what we call this network of silence. In effect, there's no thought that you're having that your loved one is likely not had as well. So why don't the two of you talk about these things? And while it can be distressing potentially and overwhelming in the beginning, these conversations can be incredibly productive. They can lead to emotional vulnerability increased connectedness, and better treatment decision-making down the line. Stacy, do you feel bad talk, sharing your feelings right now with it your is, husband? It is hard, and when you were just saying that, I think um, it, is, it is very hard to do that. And um, I was talking to my therapist about this, and we were, you know, this idea that it is, it's really hard, because ultimately when you do that, a lot of tears will be shed. It is very hard to say those things to each other. I'm afraid of losing you. I'm afraid. And there's a lot of sadness. And, um, but we talked about sometimes sadness is OK. You know, it's OK to be sad um, because it's there. It's real. And, um, and I, but I think it's hard to be sad. Uh, but it's hard to be silent, too. And I think that's also hard to, that's one thing I have trouble with my daughters. I think they don't want to be sad, right? And that's a whole other thing, right? How, how, how do they let that out? And how do you encourage them to let that out? And, one of, um, that's a one of the interesting things, you know, when I went through this more than three yes. decades ago and my mom was terminal, I was your daughter's age. Yes. And she, my mom had metastatic breast cancer and there was a lot of guilt that I felt. Mm -hmm. like. Here I am, I'm going to live and I'm going to be okay, and, and she might not. And, um, you know, can you, can you walk us through the guilt Is it, that either of you, Carla or Stacy, have felt through the process? Uh, How intense has it gotten? It, it can be very intense. Um, during the time of my mother's illness, my youngest brother was expecting a baby. Um, and the family was very concerned if she would be here for the birth. And my mom was, thankfully, and thank God for technology. So we were able to enjoy that as a family. Um, but the concerns were she was not going to be here for, you know, high school graduation and, you know, all of those special moments. And it, it, it was sad. And even to this day, it's still sad. My nephew is now six years old. Um, and the, the, her death and his birth kind of are together simultaneously in sort of an odd way. Um, mm. But we have to look past that because she did experience him for a little while and that was a blessing for her. And we try to, you know, always try to find the good, always the bright point. Um, because cancer can really put you in a dark place, um, especially as a caregiver. Um, you can become very burnt out. Um, it can just come on you. Um, I used to have my private moments in the car, crying or in the bathroom, because I would never want to have those emotions in front of my parents. And they are very powerful emotions yes. that stick with people yes. for years and years, Dr. Exactly. Applebaum. I mean, maybe not the fatigue as much, but certainly the, the emotions. Um, it, it, let me, for, I want to run through some of the things that caregivers go through, but is there a tangible way to deal with this guilty feeling? I mean, is there something you can suggest to people to, to fight off the guilt or to, is it natural to have it and to accept it? I, I, think, I think guilt, we, we, in our society, we think about this as a dirty word. 
Um, in fact, guilt is probably the most common word that is used in the caregiver's clinic. What I say to patients is when you feel guilty, you're, you're telling me you're feeling guilty because you feel like you're letting someone else down. For example, you're here in session with me, but you feel guilty because your husband's over at 53rd Street having chemotherapy. In that moment, are you truly letting your husband down, or is it possible that you're letting yourself down in some way? And so the one concrete piece, I can, piece of advice I can give in this moment is when you feel guilty, to consider if in any way you're not attending to your own needs in that moment as a different way to think about guilt. And I do want to run through some of the signs of caregiver sure. burnout sure. because I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this. Yeah, absolutely. Increased fatigue, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Feeling anxious or irritable. Difficulty engaging in caregiving responsibilities. I think that's a clear sign when you know you have to step back because then you, you're not useful to yourself mm -hmm. or anyway. to your family member. Poor self-care and frequent colds, flu, or other medical problems. Can either of you remember a time when like you hadn't brushed your hair in a week <laughs> because it's just, or you hadn't taken care of yourself, you well, know? That was one of the things that at the beginning, I did make a conscious effort. I went and got a mammogram mm -hmm. and I did all of these things that I thought, you know what, let me check myself out, make sure I'm good because this is gonna be difficult and all right, let me, and I did that. I mean, it's not like I was like, hey, I'm ready to go and everything is hunky-dory, but it was a lot of ups and downs from there. But I did, I did think of that um, because I, I think it's very easy as you get deeper and deeper to not think of it. And in a way, I don't know if, you know, there have been times that probably, yeah, I don't brush my hair, right? And so I won't get, I wouldn't have gotten that. But it back. sounded like you were taking care of something you could control. Yes. That is going and yes. getting the mammogram is something you can actually exactly. do. One of the things I remember growing up, the things that we couldn't <clears throat> control, my mother was going through chemotherapy and her immune system was down and she got shingles. Mm -hmm. And my sister and I had never had the chicken pox, I guess it is. And we were, you know, 20, my sister was 22 years old and came down with the chicken pox. So now on top of the chemotherapy and the shingles, mm -hmm. my big sister had a terrible case of the chicken pox. And then I had the anxiety of worrying that I was going to get it because they didn't have the vaccine back then. I mean, we're talking 30 years ago. So there's what you can control, which I, I think is so important because that's empowering. And then there's just the stuff that you got to throw your hands up and say, you know, I don't know, what do you say? I'm doing the best I can, or, you know, it's going to be okay, and this is minor compared to the big scheme. Well, you pick your battles. Yeah. You pick your battles, and sometimes you do things in small steps because it can become overwhelming. Um, I kept a journal of everything um, mm. so that if I had a day where, uh, like case in point, my god sister would give me a day off during the week where I could go home, and I would journal everything. So she would see all of the meals that were prepared, how my mom was with everything, medication, if she had a question who to call, and that sort of kept things sort of on track at home. It can be very overwhelming to be mm -hmm. a caregiver. There's no doubt about it. Um, so when you're talking about advice to help navigate for a loved one, one of the things caregivers tell us is that asking for help from family members and friends is very difficult, right? I mean, I don't even like asking my neighbor if I can borrow some sugar, you know, sometimes I, I don't like imposing on people. So, I, Linda, I mean, what do you, how do you counsel caregivers through this? In terms of asking for help? Asking for help from other yeah. people. So, one, give yourself the permission to ask for help. I think that, you know, just along what you were saying about guilt, I think our society has kind of put that belief on people saying, if you ask for help, that means you have failed in some way, and it, it's not about a failure. It's about saying, I need, I need extra resources to help me and my family get through a difficult time. Um, and so we, as like in terms of social workers, we're always encouraging family members and caregivers just to say, I need help, whether it's from your social worker or from your doctor in terms of how to manage the medications and the nurse, or even from a neighbor. So if you have young kids, and the neighbors are saying, how can we help? Take them up on that and say, mm -hmm. can you pick them up from school on this day because I'll be home really late. And I, I want them to have somebody consistently picking them up so they know that there's a support network around them that still, you know, we care about them and we've, we've made sure they're taken care of. 
I suppose you find it's a good barometer for figuring out who's truly meaningful in your life, which can be a good thing because people will rise to the challenge around you. Exactly. Can you think of anyone like that in your life, Carla, who stepped up? And yes, uh, my parents were fortunate to have uh, two sets of friends over 40 years. And they were like, whatever we can do, a uh, car ride to get a, a haircut, or they would bring potluck. And that would still sort of give my parents a feeling of how they used to be 40 years ago when they became friends. And that would at least give everyone a relief from the diagnosis you know, that was going on, a treatment that was going on. So, you know, when things are tough, that's when you really see who your friends are. I believe that completely. I mean, just to give you all a little more background, I've had breast cancer and ovarian cancer as well. So um, breast cancer when I was 30 and then ovarian cancer, I was diagnosed 12 and a half years later after I had genetic testing for the BRCA1 mutation. Both of them found insanely early, so I'm absolutely fine. but. I really realized when I was a mom of little kids going in for surgery for ovarian cancer, um, my family, you know, we had friends, thank God, who stepped in. They helped, they helped with the kids. Yeah. Do you find that you're figuring out who your real friends are at this point? Absolutely. I mean, and, and there are also certain people that I think um, I try to surround myself with people who are positive, that sort of support me in the right way. Um, I think that is really important as well. We recently went, um, actually Sloan Kettering had a lung cancer, a walk, and we went, we all went, my whole family, my daughters, my husband and myself, and we, my husband walked as well, and I ran, and quite a few of our friends and family came, and it was, you know, Mark didn't feel fantastic, but he felt pretty good, he did the walk, and it was nice, uh, I think for my whole family to sort of have that support around us and just, you know, just that time together. And, you know, I mean, this is part of our life right now. It's part of our life. So, you know, well, let's, let's do this together. And uh, Have you helped your husband find his own network as well? Is he up to that or, you know? He's a really, really quiet, uh, introverted person. So, yeah, there are some people that he talks to. Um, and, you know, he does keep some inside as well. I think it must be very hard to grapple with that, especially at the age that he is. So, One of the things you mentioned before, Stacey, it was these small moments. Can you guys give me an example of a, of a good small moment where either you or your family member was able to really take a breath and enjoy something more? Or um, things you might suggest to other caregivers about an enjoyable small moment for you? For us, uh, in our family, the holidays were very important. Um, and we kept that going through chemo, radiation. We always celebrated Thanksgiving, Christmas, birthdays. That never stopped. Um, maybe it wasn't 80 people. Maybe it was only 15. Um, and we always made sure that the people we invited, our parents were comfortable with because maybe they weren't having the best moment. Yeah. Um, and they would sort of let... Uh, let them in, you know, sort of let their guard down. So smaller holidays aren't a terrible thing. No. Right? No. If you have your immediate circle. Exactly. Right? You know, exactly. Like How and about you, Stacey? I think also recognizing when you are having a good moment or a good day. Mm -hmm. uh, one day, it was fairly recently, a couple of weeks ago, it was a really nice day. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I sort of said, to myself and also to, to my husband, that was a really nice day. And then we, you know, one night um, we, we like to, we're very outdoorsy and we sat around a campfire, something that we love to do. And um, it was really nice. And we spent hours just kind of talking and sitting there looking at the fire. And the next morning we said to each other, that was a really nice night. Well, there's almost something very special, I would think. And I would think you would say this to your patients about how you can appreciate those small yes. moments yes. more because if you're thinking, oh my goodness, I don't know how long this person might be with us, and you're looking up at a beautiful blue sky, yep. that makes it you know, even more special, I, I, I would think. Do you Absolutely. tell that to, to some of the caregivers? Certainly, I, sometimes I'll say that when you've been a caregiver, you have a new pair of glasses with a different prescription. Yeah. And the information through which you're seeing the world is different. You have a heightened awareness for how beautiful just that moment of connectedness is sitting outside, a tight handhold, a look in the eyes, a smell of roasted or burnt marshmallows, whatever it is, 
that that can be the most deliciously, emotionally fulfilling moment, whereas before it was just a campfire. And certainly, yeah. so certainly we experience this. Yeah. In a whole different way. Yeah. You get in that too? In a whole different way, absolutely. And we always say it's a, it's a time for you to make meaning in terms of your relationship and uh, in terms of for your family or even just you and your spouse in yeah. terms of finding a different way of having a meaning in terms of your relationship and what that means to you before mm -hmm. all of this chaos happened. Right. So it's not always quantity it, there. It's, it's, it it's is. very much quality. Yes. On the flip side, what is caregiver's burden? Like, do you sure. get people who come in and say, I, I think I'm out, I just can't, yeah. I can't? Yeah. Um, so caregiver burden, um, this term gets, gets thrown around a lot. Um, this is a multidimensional construct that refers to all the ways in which the caregiving role can potentially, that's a key word here, potentially and negatively impact all of you as caregivers. Um, burden includes a psychological component. We know that diagnostic rates of anxiety and depression are higher among caregivers than among the patients for whom they're providing care. We know that caregivers are at risk for their own medical problems like cardiovascular disease, poor immune, immune functioning, fatigue and sleep difficulties. There's a financial component to burden we spoke about earlier, um, as well as a temporal component or time. Um, on average, caregivers are providing care for 8.3 hours a day for 13.7 months. That's on average. That that's is a, a, a full-time That job. is a full-time yeah. job on top of other full-time jobs. jobs. So, so the majority of caregivers will, at some point in the care trajectory, experience burden. And this is part of the reason why, why we're here to help. Carla, how difficult was it to maintain a family business? Because you had a family business yes. to run yes. while your father was ill. Yes. Um, and, and keep your professional life. You learn to multitask, um, write everything down. Um, my dad was an accountant, and I happened to follow in the same steps as he did. Um, and it was, a, it was hard. Uh, we went through several tax seasons uh, with him uh, receiving chemo and radiation. The clients didn't know. So he would, go, he would come here for treatment and then come to the office, and we'd have a full day of appointments and go home at night, and we did that for several tax seasons. But my father loved what he did, um, so that's why I stuck in there with him and kept him pumped up, and you stay positive, and um, my father practiced until he was 80 years old. That's amazing. Can it be a distraction, a good distraction as well? I know that the fatigue is kicking in, but I mean, I can only speak from my experience when I was going through cancer, and I was largely physically okay. I mean, I went through a lot of surgeries, but work really was uh, therapeutic at that point. Exactly. It's a lifesaver because for those eight hours a day or 10 hours, whatever your job is, it, you're not dealing with cancer. Right. You're communicating with colleagues or clients or whatever you know, your love is, um, and thank God for that. Yeah. And for me, that's what saved me during that time with my parents. I worked, and then I was my mom's aide at night, um, and that was our special time to watch, I don't know, HGTV or her cowboy movies or look at old family photos and then go back to work in the morning. And I had people around me saying, we don't understand where you're getting this energy from. And I said, I don't look too hard at it. You just sort of keep going. I like that. Mm -hmm. I like that. Stacy, are you finding a balance yet? It's, it's, it's hard. It's hard, yeah, and it's still pretty new, and, um, and, and I think that is true about work. I, I mean, um, you know, Mark is an attorney, and he's still working as an attorney, and hopefully will be for a long time. And I think during that time, he's who he is. Right. You know, he's, he's still that person. And I think it's very hard to not make sure that cancer doesn't completely identify who you are. Like, you're the cancer person. You're the wife of a cancer patient. You're the mother of a cancer. Right. Yes. And because that's just one part of who you are. And I think that that's something to think about and try to um, work with. And then you can be your old self if you're doing your job, too. Oh, yes. I teach. I teach creative writing. And um, I love it. And I write as well. And I have actually been writing a lot um, since this happened, uh, which is also really therapeutic. Um, and uh, yeah, it definitely helps because uh, your mind is just there. And again, you're back to who you are. And I think that that's something you can't let go of. 
I want to talk a bit about the holidays because the holidays are coming up and it can be a great time for some families and a tough time for some families. How do you counsel patients and caregivers to navigate through that? Is there anything mm -hmm. tangible that you guys tell them to get by? Um, so for the holidays, one thing we do say, you know, like, figure out if you're the house that actually is where everyone comes together and says, let's have our Thanksgiving here or um, the Christmas holidays or Hanukkah, what, you know, whatever it may be. If your house is a central place and you feel like you're already spent, I can't be that hostess. Then I feel like down. that, and I'm not a caregiver, <laughs> so I mean, I can understand. If you can sit down and say to yourself, look, if you have other families like sisters or brothers or you know adult children, and say, you know, I want to have it at the house. I want to keep this tradition still. Mm -hmm. Can we have it as a potluck? Can exactly. everybody bring something to the house and we we partake together? Mm -hmm. um, and if you've lost a loved one. I really feel like that's a good time for you also to maybe start making new traditions in terms of what was what was significant for that person that you lost in terms of um, the holidays and start making a new tradition around that person during that holiday time. And Stacy, this will be really your first holiday, right? So have you have you been formulating a plan or is it too much pressure? Have you kind of just said we're not doing it this year? Or? I j I'm just yeah, I'm not even going there yet. I I spoke to a friend today who her husband has been battling cancer for 14 years and uh, is doing really well. And she's a really good person to talk to yeah. actually. Um, and she said, you know, she gave me really good advice. This was earlier today and she said, you know, I know it's hard but just one day at a time, one day. And I am trying to do that, and I think it does help a little bit, so. The only thing I would add to that um, is, is to also challenge yourself to accept that this holiday is going to be different, and that efforts to yes. try to recreate the holiday from last year or 10 years ago is likely not the best use of energy. So how can, how can we work with the limitations of what we have right now? Is your loved one gonna be in the hospital? Well, what, what can we do that would make this a little bit like the holiday that we used to have as a family and really connect to those traditions? Because they're usually not contingent on the environment, like being in a house with a fire and a Christmas tree. It's usually about the connections, the human connections, the love, the music, the food. All of these things are can be brought in and transported to different settings. Absolutely. Does Memorial help with, with the holiday times that to your knowledge that we, you Yeah, we try, you know, like in, we just had um, a panel discussion about talking about coping with the holidays, around the holidays. Um, and our social workers really, you know, we're mindful about the holidays coming up and how difficult it can be for families who are just starting in this journey and what, it, what that uncertainty, you know, comes with it and unfolds. And um, so, and then there's young kids involved as well. So, and you want to appreciate that young kids want to keep that routine and want to enjoy their holidays. So, we try to help guide you in terms of saying, well, let's talk about what that family unit looks like and who's around you in terms of your network and explore other ways of, of appreciating and learning and reflecting on the holidays and creating new memories. I want to talk a little bit about Memorial Sloan Kettering's family care program. Um, and the things that, that are offered that, that you know about. Um, we, you can call 646-888-0100 mm -hmm. um, and get what sorts of re what sure. sort of resources do you um, offer? So I'm really, really thrilled to say that Memorial Sloan Kettering is doing an absolutely phenomenal job in supporting caregivers. Um, our family care program is housed in our counseling center and we provide support to caregivers of patients with all sites and stages of cancer in any relationship to the patient at any point in the caregiving trajectory. Um, we have a caregiver's clinic. It is the first of its kind in the nation and in the world to provide specific support to caregivers. Um, we also have a family and couples therapy clinic. We have support for parents of children and adolescents with cancer and also a bereavement clinic. So we have a lot of resources coming out of this program. We also have a lot of resources outside of the family care program, which I'm happy to mention as well. Well, we want to let our audience know that uh, just something else we want to let you know about uh, the caregivers video that you saw at the top of this program will be later this month also on the caregiver support webpage, which will include advice and, and tips for caregivers. Um, I think it's really important that you have a caregivers clinic. 
that really, I don't recall that being around when I went through all this, certainly not for someone my age. Is the clinic for, it's for all ages or do you, you know, have to be a certain? All, all ages. The clinic is for, for anyone who identifies as a caregiver to someone here at, who's receiving care at Sloan Kettering. Um, and that means that you could be a blood relative, a chosen family, a friend, a neighbor, a pen pal, I said earlier, someone who's been affected by a loved one's cancer treatment. Um, and we provide individual and group support by licensed clinical psychologists and psychiatrists. Um, and really we addressed a variety of issues that many of which we've already addressed here, including caregiver burden, communication, talking about difficult topics like prognosis and possibly death and dying if that's coming up. Um, really we're here to help to support you along this journey. But there's a lot to be gained from a support group. And I know, uh, Carla, you mentioned that yes. you're part of a support group. Yes. And I know, Stacy, you've, you've reached out as well. Can you talk about that as a resource? Um, I actually was contacted by the social worker that was working with my mom and asked if I would participate. Um, at that time, my father and I went. He went for a couple sessions and he said, I'd rather just stay home with the TV. Um, but I continued to go. And with that, you realize you're not alone. You're not the only person going through this journey. And it really helped. And you also uh, make connections and friends, not just for that moment, but through your other journeys. How many people were in your group? That you I would say about 15 people. And, and were they all at different stages of the game? Yes. You know, so, but, so you could relate to them, but everybody had sort of a different thing going on? Yes. Yeah. And, how about and all with different ages as well. Well, I was just, I, I have a social worker therapist from Sloan Kettering who I love and love talking to, and she's really, really helpful. I mean, things happen during the week, and I'm like, okay, I'll just tell Jackie about that, and then it'll be okay. Um, and so that is huge. But I was thinking when you said about what your dad would rather have stayed home, <laughs> I think that is very true, that people, everyone is different. Mm -hmm. And to accept that. I, I think maybe I would, I do like sharing, maybe I would benefit from a support group, but I don't know that my husband necessarily would. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something just to accept. And um, sometimes it's hard to accept that because we look at it from our perspective, right? Well, well that would help make me feel better, but maybe it wouldn't right. make him. Right, because so. you may not feel as though you want to share. Right. You know, sometimes you may go to group and maybe you're not sharing for that particular moment, but maybe the next session you feel as though you're ready to share. Sometimes you could learn a lot by listening. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. And you Absolutely. feel better by, it, it's just kind of human nature, but you feel better knowing other people are unfortunately going through the same yes. thing. Yes. Do you, do you find yourself still in touch with people yes. in your group? Like they, they became friends? Yes, through Facebook, um, which has been nice and for different occasions. Um, you know, your birthday or Christmas or holidays, people will reach out just to say, you know, how's it going? And that's been nice. And if we're talking about resources, what, what's the story with the uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering portal? Is that, is that a helpful way to get in as well? It is, it's a helpful way in terms of um, if you have questions for your medical team immediately, um, that's a great place for family members and patients to put like questions up. and. It is reviewed nonstop by um, our office practice nurses. So then they can kind of say, okay, who does this have to go to? Does this need to go to the social worker? Who can then kind of assess it with the caregiver or the patient and then and then triage it to whether it's Dr. Applebaum or how quickly? Management. How quickly are those questions looked at? Um, they are they are reviewing that every day, all day. So there's always someone watching. It's just like someone being on call. <laughs> That's exactly what it's That's like. That's pretty great, though. I mean, because it's not like you're calling a number and hoping to call the doctor and find out an answer that you can't seem to get. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's definitely something. Do, do a lot of people take advantage of it? I mean, I'm not sure. That's a good question. I'm not sure if a lot of people take advantage of it. I think that you know we allow we let people know like there is a portal. Not everybody is tech savvy, so they might stay away from it and say, no, can I have a number instead? Um, and, and that's fine. So we give them the option of saying, here's um, the portal, or you can have a phone number. It does, I, I do get answers really you quickly do. on the portal from the office. And it is, because sometimes you even, you're just not in the mood to get on the phone. And it's a whole different thing. <laughs> right. True. I really like it. And it works really well. And, and, and this is just, quickly. you know, questions about your husband's An appointment or like an appointment, appointment, a time, a change of a time, you know, little things like that. Really, you know, more pressing issues. 
we, I wouldn't put on the portal. But you know, something that you, you know, in the past would have to call about, I can just ask, hey, can we change this time, et cetera? And they get right back. Let's talk for a minute about something Carla knows all too well, the, the bereft caregiver. And what are some of the things that you've gone through? Mm. You've lost both your parents. You lost mm. your mom at first yes. in 2012. Yes. And your dad in 2014. Yes. It's a really, really difficult situation. And now your sister has breast cancer. Uh, she has, uh, she had breast cancer, thank God she's a survivor, but she has uh, pulmonary hypertension. Um, so when you lose two family members, especially let alone one, I mean, yeah. how, how do you let go? Well, after my father passed, I, uh, to this day, I have a therapist. I didn't really, I went to one group session, it wasn't here at Sloan, I wanted something closer because I live on Long Island, and when I went into the session, it was bedlam. Um, the therapist didn't have control of the participants. Mm -hmm. I was in tears, okay. and I said, I'm not ready for this type of setting. And then I was fortunate to find someone who was very sensitive, and she was amazed that I was able to survive through two parents um, as their primary caregiver. Have you adjusted to the new normal? Is there a new normal that, that suddenly takes hold, or you know, have you not really adjusted? When my mom was diagnosed, it was new normal on the spot. Mm -hmm. uh, she was not diagnosed here. She was diagnosed somewhere else. Um, the way it was told, it was told to me very quickly in a corner, your mother has breast cancer. <laughs> and then we went in the doctor's office. And then it was, let's just give you an appointment for surgery. I'll be back in two weeks. And as soon as we got out of the doctor's office, I said, we're going to Sloan Kettering. This is bizarre. Because <laughs> um, my father was already a patient here. And I said, why are we dealing with this other hospital? This is insane. And when we came here, I was like, thank God, people have uh, empathy, they care, they follow up, they call. Um, when my mother had her surgery, the surgeon came the next morning, my mother was up, she was a champ, and the surgeon was said to her, you're up, you're out of the bed, how can you be doing that? She said, I'm ready to go, I wanna go home. Um, so how tough was it to let go when you <laughs> lost her? Well. And have, have you let go? I mean, or? you, you know, <laughs> the, this is really personal. Um, my mother passed New Year's Day. And three days before New Year's, I had gone to my parents' house and my dad was writing the bills and my mom was inside sort of resting. And she was just hanging on, she was a champ. And I said to her, I said, Mom, I said, we're gonna miss you like you have no idea but it's okay. And I couldn't believe I actually did that, but she, it was, she needed to let go. We needed to let her go because it was tough. It was tough and I did everything, morphine and you know, the gamut. And uh, she was here for several days and um, she passed New Year's Day. And it's very weird, that day when I woke up and I was getting ready to go to work, I didn't go to work, I went to see my parents, I actually felt someone tapping my shoulder. And I went into my parents' house, as I mentioned, my father was writing the bills, and I closed the door. And my mom and I got in this conversation, and she said, you understand? I said, yes, mommy, I understand. I was a, I'm a girl, that could be me going through this. Do you, do you, what do you tell patients? Is there anything, do you tell caregivers anything about letting go? Or sure. is there anything it's, you can tell people yeah. about? It was, it was very difficult. And my father, I was there when he took his last breath. I can't, I can't imagine. And I, I was just, it was devastating. I was devastated, but that's why I immediately got a therapist because I wanted to feel better. And as Stacy mentioned, my parents were not cancer. My parents were Mickey and Earl. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to remember. So thankfully, now I don't carry cancer around with me. I carry my, par my parents with me. Yeah. But it took a long time to get to that. Um, I can tell you, I could not come in this area 
no. without breaking down. Sure, sure. I don't think that we can ever truly prepare to lose someone that we love, despite how long their end of life may be, despite how anticipated their death may be. I just don't think that we can actually be prepared. I do think that we do ourselves a disservice by not talking about death and dying. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that you communicated with your mom that it was okay for her and that you would be okay, that was such a gift for both of you. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the best thing that we can do is just speak more openly with our loved ones about death and dying. Um, again, these are difficult conversations so to have. I'm, it takes so much courage. But what ends up happening is then there's such an opportunity for increased connectedness and then for you to know that you did everything you could and for years later to be able to say, I did it with pride and I'm now carrying her legacy and my mom's with me. Right. And I bet that had you not had those conversations, you might not be sitting here right now sharing with us with such confidence and grace and poise about this experience. Can I just add to that in terms of you just said it and it's about creating a legacy. So it's not about creating the legacy right near the end of someone's life, right. but just continuing to create the legacy as they go through this journey and you're going along parallel with them through that journey. And having that time then, to right. spend with yeah. them to create that, you know, if someone dies a very sudden way, you don't get to say yeah. goodbye. We want to we want to go to uh, some questions <laughs> from the audience, which I will try to tackle. <sighs> What is the worst thing a caregiver can do? What should we avoid doing or saying? Is there a no-no? I don't think there's, a, you know, there's no handbook for caregiving. There's nothing that we can say, okay, well, you know, your loved one now is diagnosed with a cancer. Here's a book. There, there, we don't have that. So there is no right or wrong way of being a caregiver. So let that piece of it go. Was there something there's, you regretted, Carla? Um, I just knew for my parents, I would not unravel in front of them at an appointment um, because they may have been unraveling. Yeah. You know, so we didn't all need to be unraveling. That was not good for all of us. Um, that was that was my only thing. Just trying to sort of keep it together as best as we could. Here's an interesting one. How, in the shadow of a cancer diagnosis, do the experts suggest you can continue to? relate in the normal ways. For example, non-cancer related arguments like leaving the toilet seat up <laughs> or the cap off the toothpaste with your loved one. How can you maintain normalcy in the relationship dynamics piece of this? Because spouses can fight over all of this stuff. Does that stuff seem little or does it, I don't, how can you relate? Is it okay to get upset with them still for, for all the normal things? My husband was very, um helpful and very empathetic. Uh, he was very close to my parents. So when I told him that I needed to move home with my parents for about four months or so, it was very difficult for us and it was a little touchy at times. Um, but you have to have that open line of communication that was very important. Your husband was supportive though. Do you Extremely. find and you, do you suggest anything in your practices? Well, I, I mean for Stacy, so. it's different because her husband is the patient. So right. that's exactly. a whole other dynamic. Exactly. But um, I imagine this creates a lot of matters. There is a lot of tension, and certainly there are limitations. For example, if, if your loved one with cancer is unable to physically do the things he once did, obviously you can't expect him to do those things. But barring that, cancer is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. Right. And there are certain expectations <laughs> in the Remember that. Am I, am I allowed to say that? <laughs> that, that, that within reason. Um, that, that I, I would encourage dyads, couples, families to try, if they can, to maintain the type of relationships and the type of responsibilities they had before cancer right. as much as possible. Because Being it also human. makes them it exactly. makes them realize they're still alive. Right. I mean, yeah. you're right. still alive, you're still normal. Right. I remember you're when engaged. I had cancer, I didn't want people feeling right. bad for exactly. me because then I felt really sick. Exactly. Right? right? I'm not sure how well you can answer this. Are there resources at Memorial Sloan Kettering regional sites, Basking Ridge in particular? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so they do, we do have um, a face-to-face <coughs> -face caregiver support group at Basking Ridge. Um, oh, all our sites actually have support groups. Um, so if you know who your social worker is um, at one of those regional sites, um, connect with them and they can give you that information. And then we also have an online um, caregiver support group that runs three times a month. Um, so you can choose whichever time you prefer to attend. Um, and all you need is a computer or even just a telephone. 
and um, you can be part of a, that support group. These are two really good questions. What advice do you have for caregivers who don't agree with the patient's decision about treatment? Mm -hmm. Um, this, this comes up quite frequently in the clinic where, where the caregiver and the patient are disagreeing on, on goals of care. Um, I really encourage open communication to discuss why is it the patient is deciding to go in a direction and the caregiver is disagreeing. Oftentimes what happens is that we carry with us what we call automatic images and automatic thoughts, experiences from our past, perhaps our past experiences of illness and loss in our own families that are shaping how we're facing our illness experience now. And those past experiences don't always necessarily translate to the present moment, but can be impacting our decision making. And so I think the first place is we're going to drive this down, communication, 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 but specifically around why is this your desire? Why is this your intention? And get a little bit more information about why the patient might want to do this. How about an old-fashioned list of the pros and cons? Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> writing it down, too. But I, what, what advice do you have about the difficult um, conversations caregivers and patients have to have about a health care proxy or a living will? Yeah. I think this has to happen immediately. Mm -hmm. um, as early as possible. I think that the longer that... You shouldn't feel guilty about, again, about... Absolutely yeah. not. You know what? I make the comparison is I say you have a car insurance and you have health insurance. Exactly. Healthcare proxy, living will, is also like an insurance. Absolutely. You want to make sure that everything is just taken care of up front. And you're not saying to them, like, okay, let's just get everything prepared and in order for when you die. But no, it's not about that. It's about just making sure that everything is taken care of ahead of time because there's so much anxiety already around the cancer diagnosis. So if you well, put I, it in I, more practical more practical terms right. rather than morbid terms. Well, I think really what this is doing is it's creating a conversation for the family to have an awareness of what the patient's wishes are and goals mm -hmm. for care. Right. Yes. And this is a conversation, by the way, that should not just happen once, but it should happen a handful of times across the caregiving trajectory because that decision making process may change. Especially if people are people have are living with cancer exactly. for years and years exactly. now. Exactly. Well and I was thinking that really should be something that everyone has. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That everyone exactly. because anyone can yeah. That's walk right. outside and get hit by a bus. Hopefully that won't happen. But I mean yeah. that we all should right. have these arrangements. Right. And I think maybe approaching it that way is helpful. Well, you've all been so tremendously helpful. I've relived a lot of what I went through, and I can honestly say, even though it was years ago for me, that being a caregiver was definitely the toughest time in my life. And I don't envy any of you, but I, I'm so respectful, and I admire you for everything you have done, honestly, and everything you will continue to do, and whatever help you can provide to other people. It's really, really inspirational. Mm -hmm. So that is it for our Cancer Smart discussion, and thank you to all of our panelists, Dr. Applebaum, Linda Matthew, social worker, Carla Smith, and Stacy Lawrence. And please be sure to visit www.cancersmart.org to learn about upcoming Cancer Smart programs at Memorial Sloan Kettering. You can also find great resources and support on their Facebook and Twitter pages. That's at Sloan underscore Kettering. And thank you all for joining us. Thank, thank you. you.